part two of chapter six, which is uh, principles of pathophysiology. Uh, in this half of the lecture, we'll talk about the pathophysiology of the um, other systems, uh, excluding the cardiovascular and the respiratory or the cardiopulmonary system, as we often refer to it. So the fluid. Uh, fluid balance, of course, is huge uh, in the human body. Uh, we have certain amounts of fluids that have to be in certain places in order for things to function appropriately. Uh, the body is uh, at least 60% water, and of that 60% water, 70% of that uh, is intracellular, 5% intravascular, and 25% is interstitial. So here's a, we'll take a half a split second here to uh, just discuss some uh, prefixes here, intra and inter. Intra means within, and inter means between. So if you think about the interstate, the interstate runs between state to state to state. Uh, so interstate 80 goes from Iowa to Nebraska, and so on and so forth. Um, intracellular or intravascular, meaning within those structures. So an intrastate would be more like um, an, an in-state only highway um, that doesn't leave the state. And so intracellular meaning that most of that water, 70% of our total body water, is inside the cells that we have. 5% is inside the vessels, so meaning most likely the blood plasma that we've discussed before. And then 25% being interstitial. Think of that as kind of free water uh, in, the, in the body uh, that's uh, between cells. Uh, you could kind of think of it as kind of like mortar between the bricks, I guess, um, as uh, interstitial fluids. So fluid regulation. Uh, fluid re regulation is uh, basically controlled uh, in the brain. The brain uh, will tell us that, hey, I'm thirsty. We need to add some water. This is usually done as a, uh, a hormonal response. Uh, the kidneys will take a reading on this whole thing, and they'll send some signals to the brain saying, hey, you know, kind of getting a little dry down here. Um, let's tell the body to drink some, some fluids. The kidneys control that elimination of fluid, and uh, at the same time, when they're saying, hey, we're getting a little dry here, they are kind of clamping down. They're saying, okay, we're not going to let as much water out. Uh, we don't know when we're going to get our next drink, so let's just hold on to it. And then the blood plasma pulls, uh, proteins pull fluid into the bloodstream. So once the blood starts to get a little uh, thicker uh, due to lack of fluid, uh, it will start to zap the other sources of water in the body. Because blood plasma is thick and heavy, uh, it has, uh, in a physics sense, has the advantage because it can say, hey, we need to make, th make sure that everything is about the same. So it's going to start to pull water its way uh, and makes it harder for the other structures to compete. Uh, this may make the cells start to uh, collapse on their own. So, The cell membrane and the capillary permeability regulate the flow in and out. Uh, that cell membrane is going to try to maintain. So, uh, I mean, there's a constant pull there. However, the cell membrane usually is a weaker pull than that is of the, of the vessels. And that capillary permeability uh, regulates flow in and out. We get these super uh, expanded or dilated capillaries, those can leak a lot of fluid. So. <clears throat> fluid, fluid disruptions, uh, we can have fluid loss or dehydration. Uh, that's obviously a decrease in the, in the total water volume. This comes from a, a variety of reasons. The biggest reasons why people get dehydrated are excessive vomiting and excessive diarrhea. Um, that's one of the ways that your body loses an insane amount of water all at once. Um, you can become dehydrated just simply from not drinking, and you know you're going to still urinate some. Um, you're, when you uh, exhale, you lose a little bit. You lose a little bit of water from your skin. Uh, you can lose lose it in various other methods, but it takes much longer. Fluid distribution it's not getting where it needs to go. Sometimes we have problems with our cardiovascular system. Um, sometimes the water gets away from it in the form of edema, 
uh, and it deposits, it deposits it in other spots, such as the lungs, the ankles, the lower back, the abdomen, um, and even sometimes in the hands. So that's when we have this excess amounts of water. The nervous system. Uh, the nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. Obviously, they're fairly well protected. They're protected by the uh, spinal cord. I'm sorry, by the spinal column and uh, the skull. Uh, they're covered by several protective layers, which are referred to as the meninges. And these are a, a layer, uh, three layers thick actually. And then there's a layer of shock-absorbing fluid called cerebral spinal fluid, or we'll often uh, abbreviate that as CSF cerebral spinal fluid, uh, and those are all trying to protect uh, those very delicate nerves. They're obviously still subject to damage from trauma or disease, um, <clears throat> and uh, those things can certainly take take a quick toll on, on your quality of life. Um, if you suffer a, a major back injury, uh, you may be paralyzed, obviously. Uh, you can uh, develop uh, different types of disease processes, such as uh, um, meningitis, which will disrupt that. You may have something like um, multiple sclerosis, several things that can pop up and, and cause uh, major havoc. So that trauma, penetrating trauma to the head, uh, causes increased swelling uh, in there. The brain really doesn't have anywhere to swell, and it starts to push out through uh, any hole it can find. There's really only one natural hole that's uh, large enough for anything to happen. That's the frame and magnum at the base of the skull, and that is where the brainstem uh, is, and, and the spinal cord comes out. Uh, we may have damage to the spine. <clears throat> you don't have to sever the spinal column or the spinal cord for it to, uh, to cause havoc. Um, all you have to do is put pressure on the cord. So if you put pressure on the cord, uh, they may have some paralysis, maybe temporary, maybe um, permanent. And uh, you may have some swelling around there. So we get that swelling, uh, say, from a back injury. Maybe it's going to put some temporary pressure on there. So there's lots of reasons why trauma can be uh, a major issue here. Not to mention, if you have a penetrating trauma to the head, say a gunshot wound, the tissue that's destroyed by that bullet tumbling through the brain is destroyed permanently. Medical causes of nervous system dysfunction, strokes, uh, infections. I brought up meningitis. Uh, meningitis is particularly uh, ugly disease in some of its forms. Uh, can be fatal. Uh, strokes, obviously, there's two different major types of strokes. There's one uh, that uh, is a blockage, which causes areas of the brain to become hypoxic. The other is a major bleed, uh, often referred to as a uh, an aneurysm, uh, brain aneurysm. And when that bleeding occurs, it's damaging tissue and it's increasing pressures. There are other diseases, such as Lou Gehrig's disease, um, multiple sclerosis, diabetes will actually take a toll on the nervous system. Um, the, the diabetes usually takes more of a toll on the uh, peripheral nervous system over time. And then and another way that diabetes can affect the nervous system is the brain requires two, or the brain requires two substances all the time, water and sugar. So that cerebral spinal fluid that I talked about uh, a slide or two back, that cerebral spinal fluid is composed of just that. It is water and it is sugar. Um, and uh, the brain is the only nervous tissue, or the only tissue, I should say, in the body that does not require insulin to use the sugar. So even if somebody doesn't have a lot of insulin in their body, the brain can still function to a degree. Not as probably well as it normally would, but um, it, it can uh, function there. Now you have so much insulin and not enough sugar, we see people go downhill immediately. Um, so endocrine system. The endocrine system uh, is a system of uh, glands, of course. They secrete hormones. These hormones are chemical messengers in most cases that control body functions. Uh, these major organ systems, including the brain, pancreas, pituitary, kidneys, thyroid, adrenal glands. Uh, so these too many hormones will cause uh, certain types of disease processes to occur. Uh, 
they will um, result in uh, maybe some excessive growth uh, or maybe low growth. Uh, they may be present at the time of birth. They may not uh, uh, come about until later in life or when somebody gets uh, to a certain age. Um, so examples of maybe too many hormones, uh, hyperthyroidism, that's too much thyroid hormone. And uh, people with hyperthyroidism are, are always hot. They're very usually very thin because their metabolism is running in overdrive. Some of us, I think, would like to have a temporary hyperthyroidism. But uh, then we also can have problems with heart rate and temperature regulation with that, too. They can get too hot. Their heart rate can go into overdrive, and that can be a, a big issue. Too few, too few, few hormones. Uh, diabetes, obviously, our biggest example there when we don't have enough insulin to do the job. But there are plenty of others, Graves' disease, um, Cushing's disease. There's a thing called acromegaly. Giantism comes from too many hormones. Uh, acromegaly is when people actually are afflicted by the same process of the cause of giantism, except it's after they've stopped growing. So uh, they start to just get uh, heavier, thicker features as opposed to continuing to get taller and taller and taller. People with giantism are stricken by this before uh, they stop growing. <clears throat> Digestive system dysfunction. Uh, this is going to impact the hydration levels and the nutrient transfer. Uh, there can be a number of things that, that cause problems with this. The biggest one that we see uh, that, that upsets the digestive system is gastrointestinal bleeding or what we call GI bleeds. Uh, these GI bleeds can be uh, either slow chronic bleeding, such as something like ulcers uh, that uh, are just generally kind of a naggy thing in most cases, or they can be massive. They can be a very ugly rectal bleed. Uh, you can have bleeds from high up in the uh, gastrointestinal system that cause you to um, constantly uh, expel uh, bright red blood. Uh, you can be vomiting blood. You can be uh, have rectal bleeding. You may have black tarry stools, and these black tarry stools are actually digested blood. Um, so it's actually a disruption to two separate systems, the digestive system and the cardiovascular system, because we're losing blood. So as you're losing this blood, um, <clears throat> you may have uh, you know, the vomiting or the diarrhea, which causes you to become dehydrated. You're losing the red blood cells as well, which causes you to become anemic. Uh, and you can have... Um, similar symptoms to that of, uh, of an MI uh, because uh, there may be abdominal pains in there that uh, mimic that of a heart attack. So vomiting and diarrhea be, uh, are number one issues that we deal with with the digestive system. Talked about this quite a bit already. Uh, they're a sign or symptom of a lot of different diseases and uh, they have a variety of causes of course. And they can re result in malnutrition or dehydration. Um, if you take in food, generally somewhere in about the 20 to 24 hour range, it will work its way through a system and then be expelled um, through defecation. If you have some sort of a disorder that causes this food to just rapidly shoot through your system, okay, we'll say, take for example, uh, Taco Bell. We have some Taco Bell and it... Uh, it wreaks havoc on your system, and you, uh, within an hour or two later, are getting rid of that. Um, your body had no time to absorb the nutrients out of that. So when it moves too quickly through the system, or you vomit it right back up, you don't have the opportunity to absorb the nutrients that you would uh, commonly get when, through the normal process of dehydration or a normal process of uh, digestion, I should say. Sometimes we also have hypersensitivities <clears throat> in which you can have an allergic reaction, and the allergic reactions can be um, as a result of certain foods. The allergic reaction not only disrupts the uh, um, respiratory system, but the immune system uh, these allergic reactions can be to a variety of things, most, mostly um, the most common ones we see is a number of drugs, 
um, the morphines, codeines, tol or not toluene, morphines, codeines, aspirins, penicillins, sulfas, uh, foods such as uh, nuts, nuts seem to be big, um, shellfish, seafood. Um, sometimes you'll have other oddball things. Some people are allergic to chocolate. There are people who say, well, I'm allergic to Benadryl. Benadryl is the number one drug that we give for people in allergic reactions. How can you be allergic to it? Well, in most cases, if they say they're allergic to Benadryl, they're actually, um, they're actually um, allergic to like one of the dyes or the, the components that they use to uh, create the pill. Um, and this is an exaggerated immune response. And the chemicals affect more than uh, just the invader. They affect the whole body. So it's kind of an over-the-top reaction uh, to being exposed. So um, it often will cause edema and a drop in blood pressure because the capillaries become very permeable. And it can be life-threatening. Uh, we, when we start to hear things of, I'm having difficulty breathing, I have a scratchy throat, um, my tongue is swelling, that's really one of those times in which you are uh, needing to be really concerned that this is going to turn uh, potentially fatal real quickly. All right, and so that wraps up Chapter 6. Obviously, pathophysiology is a huge, huge, huge thing. Um, we, can't, uh, we can't even appropriately touch on it uh, in detail. Uh, it, if we took this entire you know, five months, you guys are going to be in class. It's really much more uh, in-depth, and for every level of EMS that you decide to, to go up, you're going to learn a little bit more pathophysiology. And even paramedics, uh, critical care paramedics, don't even have uh, uh, even a, 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 a warm grasp on how widespread and how uh, amazing the pathophysiology of the human body is. So you've got to understand that there's compensation uh, in the body. The body tries to find ways to um, fix the problem, or if they can't fix the problem, to deal with the problem until the problem irons itself out. Obviously, cellular metabolism is huge. We have to have the good stuff coming in and the bad stuff going out, because uh, if we don't, then we have the potential for there to be um, a, a real quick uh, change in the system and real quick uh, degrading of the patient's condition. Remember to look at shock a little bit more, how water can uh, is a component of that. And then when evaluating a patient with a cardiac problem, consider the impact on the respiratory system. When evaluating a patient with a respiratory problem, consider the impact on the cardiovascular system. This is really huge. We have to remember that they affect each other almost immediately. When one has an issue, the other generally gets involved. Okay, shock has to be recognized immediately. So what is the pathophysiology of shock? You guys can take a look at that. And if you're treating a patient who's recently released from the intensive care unit with a massive infection, which is referred to as sepsis, this has impaired the patient's ability to regulate the size of their blood vessels. How might this affect the patient's ability to compensate for any additional illnesses? And what steps could you take to help this patient compensate? 